What's going on YouTube? My name is Papa Oxy, and welcome to an Extreme Reactors tutorial. This will be a two-part series with the first episode focusing on the reactors themselves from the mod, as well as all the different types of ports, all of the best coolants, and how to make liquid coolants, which are some of the best you can use. The second episode will focus directly on turbines, and you should expect that to come out fairly soon after this one. Everything we will cover in these tutorials will be in sections that you can find timestamped in the video's timeline or in the description. Now, we all know why you're here, so let's learn some nuclear fusion. I demand satisfaction! Oh. So first off, let's go over fuel for reactors, so you know what you will need to actually produce power. There are two different types of fuels that are used for the reactors. There is uranium, which can be found nearly everywhere as an ore, and there is verdirium, which is a liquid fuel that we create using a fluidizer. This fuel is important for turbines, but we will go over that later in the episode. If you are starting out, I'd recommend just using uranium because it's everywhere and it will get you started as soon as possible. You can also use mechanism to get eight ingots out of three raw uranium, which will help a lot with keeping your fuel reserves up. Link on how to do that in the description. Also, quick note, Gallorium used to be the fuel for the reactors, and although it's still in the game, you can't naturally make it or find it in caves. The only way to get Gallorium that I know of is to inject uranium into a reactor's port and then eject it and it will come out as Gallorium. Or you can use a fluidizer to make Gallorium fluid which will become useful later on in the mod pack. Okay, let's go over some basic information on reactors before we build one together. First off, you don't need to worry about these reactors exploding like mechanism reactors do. Secondly, there are two types of reactors. There is the basic version and the reinforced version. Obviously, the reinforced versions will perform better than the basics, but that being said, basic reactors are still really good at producing power. So if you are on a budget, it's not a bad option. Basic reactors have two different sizes. There's a three by three by three, which is the smallest you can go. And then there is a five by five by five which is the largest you can go. Reinforced reactors are a different story. The smallest one you can go for a reinforced is a five by five by five, whereas the largest is a 32 by 32 by 48. Yeah, they can get pretty big. To put it into perspective, this one right here is only a 13 by 11 by 11, and it's already massive. Now, obviously the larger you make your reactor, the more power it can produce, but also the more fuel it will use. And when you start making huge reactors like this one, the fuel usage will go up drastically. I found though that with a five x five x five reinforced reactor, my fuel usage is almost nothing and it produces enough power for me to not have to worry about upgrades. But this need can vary based off of what you are using your power for. Now, looking at the reactor, we have the controller where you can see how much power is being produced. We can see the casing heat and the core heat which typically the higher these temperatures are, the more power is being produced. And finally, we have our internal storage. Looking on the outside of the reactor, on either side of the reactor, we have our access ports, one for injecting fuel and one for ejecting waste. And lastly, we have a power tap on the back where we access the power created by the reactor. One last thing before we move on, there is no limiting factor on allowing you to build a reinforced reactor right off the bat. The only difference in making the two is that reinforced reactors require steel instead of iron, like the basic reactors do. And the only other material you need for both is graphite, which you can make by smelting coal in a furnace. Now steel is kind of a pain to produce, so here's a quick way to make some. So the best way to make steel in my opinion is by having an enrichment chamber and two metallurgic infusers. For this process we will only need iron and coal. So looking in the enrichment chamber, we will inject our coal and it will turn it into enriched carbon. We can then take that enriched carbon and put it inside of a metallurgic confuser. Once we do that, we can combine our iron ingots and we will get enriched iron. From there, the enriched iron will then go into our second metallurgic confuser where it will combine with more enriched carbon and then produce steel dust. With the steel dust, we can turn it into a furnace and it will turn it into a steel ingot. Okay, let's go over how to actually build a reactor. In this example, we are going to be using a reinforced reactor. So, inside of this chest, we have all of the materials we are going to need to build a 5x5x5 five by five by five reactor. So first off, we have 53 reactor casings and 37 reactor glass. Now, it's important to note that you do not need reactor glass to complete a reactor. You can simply use all reactor casings, but for the aesthetics of things, and just because it looks cool, I highly recommend using reactor glass, as it's not that more expensive to make, only requiring two more glass and a reactor casing in the middle. 
Now for our coolant or moderator, we are just going to be using iron. If you would like to use something better, you can skip ahead in the video where I show all the different types of coolants and which ones work the best. Moving on from the coolants, we have 12 reactor fuel rods. We have four reactor control rods. We have one reactor controller, two reactor solid access ports, one active forge energy power tap. We have some piping for importing and outporting material, some basic storage. We have a way to get the power outside of the reactor. We have some fuel, which we can use in ingot form or block form. Now, Extreme Reactors does have its own wrench, but you can also use other wrenches from other mods, so whatever one you would prefer. The wrenches honestly aren't necessary for this build, but I put them in here anyways. And then I would also like to point out the Extreme book from the mod. Now this is pretty cool because they updated it recently so it has a lot more new information in here. If there's anything I don't cover this book does an okay job at explaining it. Another thing too is if you're stumped on something you can simply look at whatever block is from the mod and you can sneak to view it and it will pull it up in the book allowing you to read what it's about. So grabbing all of our items the first thing we need to do is build the shell of our reactor using our reactor casings. Once that is complete, we can add in our ports. First, the controller, then the two access ports, and then an active power port. We will go over ports in more detail here shortly, but for now, these are the three that you will need to have a fully functional reactor. Now we can fill in all the sides with our reactor glass. Next, we will add in our coolants. We will be using a checkerboard pattern for our coolants. This is easily the best way to keep all of your fuel rods cool and also allows for the most amount of fuel rods to be in your reactor, which is what we want. Once we have done that, we can add our fuel rods in the spaces in between and close off the top by putting glass over the coolants and control rods over the fuel rods. Next, we need to add our fuel. First thing we are going to do is place down chests underneath our reactor ports and using logistical pipes from Mechanism, we can pipe items in and out. The first access port will be used for injecting fuel into the reactor. We can do so by using our configurator to select pull on the chest side of the pipe and add our fuel into the chest. And as you can see, it's being pumped into our reactor. Now we can head over to the other access port and do the same, except this one will be used for ejecting waste from our reactor, which takes the form as cyanide. Cyanite is created from the process of your reactor producing power and is made as a waste product. It's important to keep it out of your reactor, otherwise your reactor's performance can take a hit. So looking at this port, you will want to set this to outlet mode by either using a wrench to make it green, or you can click on the inside and click this button that says outlet mode. At this point, we do not have a use for cyanite, but it will be very important later on when we want to build turbines, so you should definitely hold on to it. Okay, now we can turn on the reactor from the controller, and as you can see, we are producing power. To access this power, we will need to pipe out of our active Forge Energy Power Tap into whatever object we would like to receive power. In this case, we will be piping into an energy cube. Okay, that is the basics to building a reactor. If you would like to build one bigger, just use the same method and it will work. One thing that is pretty neat about this mod is that when you make a mistake without realizing, it will tell you how to fix it. So let's say you have something that does not belong in the reactor, or in this case, you are missing a block. Not only will the multi-block not complete, but if you are right clicking on the reactor, it will give you a detailed description of what is wrong and the exact coordinates of where the issue lies. Okay, let's go over how ports work. So really we only have six different ports that we should be looking at right now. First off, we have our controller, we have our energy taps, and we have our access ports. These first four we've already gone over, except for the energy power taps, there's essentially two different ones. We have an active one, and then we have a passive one. You wanna make sure that you know the difference between the two because the active one will actively take out energy from your buffer without you having to do anything. Whereas the passive one will only take energy out of your buffer through a redstone signal. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna be using this one. So I would just focus on this guy, the active one that is. Now the access ports we've already gone over, there's not much to talk about here, but these two are a bit different. Essentially, we have the charging port and we have the redstone port. The charging port's pretty cool as it allows you to charge items that require energy through the reactor itself. 
All you have to do is place one down in a reactor like this. And if you click inside, you can take an item, charge it in this middle port here. And once it's complete, you can have it ejected into this item slot here. Now the redstone port is pretty cool, although I am not smart enough to be using it, but I will try to showcase it to you the best I can. Over here at one of our basic reactors, on the back side of this, we have two redstone ports. Now if we look inside of the first one, basically what we need to look at is the bottom portion here. You should think of these six bottom ones here as outputs and these top ones as inputs. What we want to do with these bottom ones is look for something that we find useful for our reactor. In this case, I have it set for whenever our energy stored is over 95%, the reactor will turn off. All we have to do is click on it. We can set the number manually, which I have it set for 95%. And whenever our internal buffer reaches over 95%, it will send out a redstone signal. Using redstone conduit from Ender.io, it will take that signal and transfer it over to another redstone port. Inside of this one, we have it set to an on and off input. So whenever that signal is transferred to this redstone port, it will turn it off or on, depending on what our situation is. Now this is a very useful redstone signal as whenever the reactor is running, it will always burn fuel, even when your internal energy buffer is all the way up. So using this redstone signal, it will automatically turn off the reactor when it is 100%. Now I personally haven't played around with most of these options inside of the redstone port, but I'm sure most of you can find a useful way to use these. Okay, let's go over coolant snap. Now I'm gonna rip this band-aid off right now. All the modium, vibranium, and unobtainium are not acceptable coolants in extreme reactors. I got a lot of comments about this in my last video I made for this mod, so I thought I would announce it now. We are going to look at some of the most common coolants you can use and some of the best coolants you can use. And if you would like to know if a block could be used as a coolant that I did not showcase, then you can press F3 plus H at the same time and it will enable advanced tooltips. What this does is it will allow you to look at blocks in JEI or in person and it will tell you if it is an acceptable coolant or not. Now, there are two forms of coolants. There are block forms and liquid forms. Both of them can be really good, but eventually you'll want to use liquids as your main coolants as they are better. Only some of them though. That being said though, there are many block forms that outdo certain liquid coolants. In front of me, I have a list of all the coolants I think are the most relevant, listed from best to worst. You can pause the video here to see what they are, but basically I would say that platinum and endarium are the best block form coolants, closely followed by emeralds and netherite, while redfrigerium and tangerium are the best liquid coolants, and best coolants I could find overall. To make liquid coolants, we will need another machine called the fluidizer, which we will go over here shortly. I did all of my testing using a 5x5x5 reactor, and although the numbers can be very similar, the bigger your reactor gets, it is definitely worth using better coolants because it will make a huge difference as the fuel consumption increases. Now, it's not likely that you will do this, but you can mix your coolants inside the reactors. With these examples, you can see that I have different block form coolants inside of this reactor, and over here you can see that I have liquid and block form coolants mixed together. Also, if you use liquid coolants, to get the best efficiency, you will need to place the coolants in all the air gaps. You can't just place a bucket at the top and let it waterfall down. The reactor will still operate, but the efficiency will be worse. Also, the placement and amount of control rods matter as well for efficiency. The best pattern for fuel rods is a checkerboard pattern like this, but you can also just have one fuel rod or the whole thing can be only fuel rods. But I would not recommend this at all. Alright, let's go over fluidizers. Basically, there are two different types of fluidizers that we need to focus on. The first one handles solid materials to produce coolants, and the other one handles liquids to produce things like fuel and other things, but we'll be focusing on this one in the next episode regarding turbines. For this episode, we're going to focus on the one that handles solids, which is this one here. And to build a fluidizer, it's much like building a reactor. We have a 5x5x5 area with fluidizer casings. And in the middle of those 5x5s, we have fluidizer glass. And in the middle of this fluidizer, you're going to leave it empty. There's nothing that's going to go in in there. Next, we have our fluidizer controller, which we place down in the middle like this, much like a reactor. On the back side, we have an output port here, which we are using to output things into any type of tank that we have regarding fluids. Now this here is a power port. We need to actually power the fluidizer for it to operate correctly. In this case, we just have a creative energy cube feeding power into the fluidizer and that's how it's getting its power. 
Now over here, we have two different types of solid injectors. Well, when I say two different types, they're actually the same thing, just injecting two different types of materials. In this case, we want to produce tangerium. To do so, we just need to combine angelocyte and we need to combine enderpearls. And in this case here, we just have some logistical transporters outporting those materials into the fluidizer using solid injectors. If we click inside, you can see that these materials are just sitting in these chambers waiting to go inside of the fluidizer. Now, if we look into the fluidizer controller, you can see that we have turned it on and these two items are now combining inside of there to where it's making tangerium. We can also see that we have an internal energy buffer. This is where we're going to be holding our energy to power this thing up. Now coming back to the back side of this here, we can see that we have a fluid tank here that has a bunch of tangerium into it. And as you can see, it just poured some more into there. And as you can see, we just have like some extra pipes here to go into different types of fluid tanks. Like in this one, we have cryomissy or I don't know how you say that. I think that's how you say it. So I'm not going to go over how to make all the different types of fluids as the JEI is already really good at doing that. So there's no point in me showcasing that. Also, we'll go over this one in the next episode. Over here, we can create Ferdarium and some other stuff that we need for turbines. And that's more regarding the turbine side of things. So we'll just save that for the next episode. All right, guys, that's going to be the end of this episode. I really wanted to rectify my last video. I felt like it was pretty bad and lacked a lot of information. So hopefully this one made up for it. If you guys enjoyed it, please let me know down in the comments. Also, let me know if there was anything that you would like to be covered that I missed. And also, if you guys enjoy this type of content, please subscribe. And that will let me know that you want to see more of this kind of stuff. So I'll talk to you all later. Peace out.